This message comes to you from Withenshaw Community Church, Manchester. We hope that you are inspired and challenged by God's Word. Good morning. How many is awake this morning? Isn't it good that we had an extra hour? How many enjoyed the extra hour? <laughs> I did, I did. But honestly, I must admit, you know, somehow I didn't even um, hear my, my alarm um, ringing. So, because I've got my, 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 my watch that wakes me up every morning. So somehow, I didn't even feel it. I got up and looked at the time and I'm like panicking and uh, rushing, but made it in time. Praise God. Today I want to talk to those who are hurting this morning. Today God's laid a message for me for those who are afraid. All you have to do is watch the news, right? God has laid on my heart a message for those who are worried, those who are feeling alone, those who are exhausted and, and kind of worn out and... If you're here and you feel like losing hope, this is a message the Lord has laid on my heart for you this morning. Honestly, I believe so many of our problems comes from, you know, a lot of, a lot of the problems, a lot of the uh, pain and disappointments in life comes from um, not really understanding the true nature of God. How many know our God is good? He is good all the time. Amen. Our God is holy. He is. Our God is loving. He's merciful. And he's compassionate God. That's the God we serve. Guess what? He's here this morning. He's here this morning. He's here this morning. I want to, this morning, help you to really get to know God. So if you're here this morning, you feel you're in pain or you're hurting or you're afraid or you feel uh, alone and exhausted about life, you feel uh, pressured, anxiety, whatever it is, you're losing hope. Um, I want to encourage you this morning. First and foremost, you're not the only one. There are other people in the same place you are right now. Secondly, one of the great prophets in the Bible, Jeremiah, was in your shoes, was in the place that you feel right now. And, and I want to I I read from Lamentation chapter 3, verses 1 to 23. And, and it reads this. This is Jeremiah crying out to God. Verse 1. I am the one who has seen the afflictions that come from the rod of the Lord's anger. He has led me into darkness, shutting out all light. He has turned his hands against me again and again all day long. He, is, he has made my skin and flesh grow old. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and surrounded me with anguish and distress. He has buried me in a dark place like those long dead. He has walled me in and I can't escape. He has bound me in heavy chains. And though I cry out and shout, he has shut out my prayers. He has blocked my way with a high stone wall. He has made my road crooked. He has hidden like a bear or a lion waiting to attack me. He has dragged me off the path and torn me into pieces, leaving me helpless and devastated. That's deep. He has drawn his bow and made me the target of his arrows. He shot his arrows deep into my heart. My own people laugh at me. All day long they sing their mocking songs. He has filled me with bitterness and given me a bitter cup of sorrow to drink. He has made me chew on gravel. He has rolled me into the dust. Peace has been stripped away and I've forgotten what prosperity is. 
I cry out. My splendor is gone. Everything I had hoped for from the Lord is lost. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Let me just stop here. There's a lot of fancy words there, right? And some of us can miss what Jeremiah is saying this morning. So if Jeremiah was here this morning and he wanted to explain to us what he's going through, this is how he would say it in today's language. He basically would say, you know, people, they suck. People suck. Life isn't fair. My body is a wreck. Can't sleep. I am broke. I am broke. And I feel overwhelmed with anxiety and depression. And you know what's worse? God doesn't seem to care. That's basically what Jeremiah is saying in this first 20 verses. But I love where Jeremiah all of a sudden takes this in verse 21. Listen to what he says. Yet, I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercy never ceases. Great is his faithfulness. And guess what? His mercy begins afresh each morning. So every time you wake up in the morning and you have the breath of life in you, remember this. God's mercy are fresh every morning. Come on, church. Come on, church. That's the God we serve this morning. Yes, I might be going through hell, but when I wake up in the morning, I know God's mercies are there. I can have this hope because I'm a child of God. Amen. So today I want to talk about the mercy of God. I want to talk about the mercy of God. But most importantly today, I want to talk to all of us. You know, the same mercy that we have received, we need to make room to give that same mercy back. Okay? So the title of my message this morning is Make Room for Mercy. Can we all say that? Make room for mercy. Come on. Say that again. Wonderful. I think you're ready now. Father, we just want to thank you. We want to honor you. We want to praise you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. Oh, Father, you're such a merciful God. Father, I want to pray that you give us hope today through your word. Give us hope. Father, I want to pray that we may experience your mercy, that we may experience your goodness, your grace, and your faithfulness. And Father, I want to pray that you help us to be changed in your presence by the power of your word this morning. Help us to make room for mercy towards others, Father. And this morning, I want to pray that you use me this morning as your instrument to share this word. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Everybody say, amen. amen and amen. Mercy of God. Wow. You know, when we think about God, there are a lot of attributes that God has. Okay? God is love. Is that true? God is love. God is mercy. God is grace. God is compassionate. And at the same time, they're all true, but somehow they overlap. But at the same time, they're all unique. Let me just give you a couple of examples. When you think about justice, what is justice? Justice is when you don't get, when you get what you deserve, right? When you get what you deserve. Just think about it. This morning, I'm rushing. I was late. <laughs> so I'm rushing. I'm going to pick my sister up. I'm going fast. I'm going fast, and if I get a ticket, that's justice done, right? I deserve that ticket, right? So grace, what is grace? Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. How many here this morning deserve 
to be received. How many, how many of you reserve your salvation? Deserve your salvation? Can I see any hands? I'm sorry, you don't. No, none of us, none of us deserve salvation. None of us can work our way to heaven. None of us are good enough for God. We don't deserve grace, right? We are saved by grace. God gives us something that we don't deserve. Now, what is mercy? Mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. Okay, I told you this morning, I was a bit naughty. Sorry, David. I know you um, are very, very keen on good driving. This morning wasn't very good driving. I was going fast. Okay, and I, 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 did, I did ask for forgiveness this morning, so I'm at peace with it, okay? But if the police was, you know, if, if they, they stopped me, right? They have every right to give me a ticket, right? Because I was breaking the law. I was going too fast. Now, just imagine when, if the, if the police um, stopped me and they came and I just explained what happened. And somehow in their heart, they felt a bit of uh, mercy. And they said, I know, I know you deserve a ticket. But I'm going to give you grace and I'm going to let you go. Can you see all these three things are the same, but at the same time a little bit different? Right? Now, Apostle Paul reminds us of our spiritual condition without Christ. And he shows us God's mercy in an amazing way. Let me just read from Ephesians chapter 2. I want to read from verses 1 to 3. And he says this. Once... You were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He's the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. That's deep. Then, Apostle Paul reminds us, all of us used to live this way. Isn't it easy we look at the people outside and we say, man, you're just controlled by the devil and, 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 and you, just, you just want to point fingers, right? But then Apostle Paul reminds us that we were all living that way, following the passionate desires and the afflictions of our sinful nature. But, our very, but by our very own nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. We were subject to God's anger. Death because of disobedience. Death because of sin. Death because of uh, obeying the devil ultimately. Following our sinful desires. And we were subject to God's anger and God's wrath. Now the question is when we think about God and we say God is loving. How can God be loving and angry at the same time? Can love and, and, and anger coexist? The answer is simply yes, it can. Let me tell you if, you, if you're a parent here this morning, right? You know you love your children, right? You love your children. And most of the time, children are amazing. They do, they do obey you and they do all the good things and there's no problems. But there are times when they are disobedient, Right? There are times they might lie to you. And you know that they're lying. And you're just waiting for them to just come clean. But they just don't want to come clean. Right? You love them still. But you don't, you're angry at the fact that they're lying to you. And they don't even want to come clean. And they know that you know that they're lying. But they still don't want to come clean. But you still love them. So love and anger can, can coexist remember what we were without Christ we are dead to sin we are obeying the devil we are subject to God's anger to God's wrath but I love this listen to these two words in verse 4 but God 
But God is so rich in mercy. He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ Jesus from death. And then here reminds us again, it is only by God's grace that you are being saved. You have been saved. Only by God's grace. You see, even though we deserve God's anger, even though we deserve to be punished, because God is so rich in mercy, He didn't want to give us what we deserve. We deserve God's anger. But He didn't want to give us that. So, if you are here this morning and you think to yourself sometimes, and I think all of us have come to that place, God is not fair. God is not fair. I want to thank, I want to remind you, thank God he's not fair, right? Thank God he's not fair. Imagine if he was fair all the time. Man, we would be, we deserve God's wrath and punishment, right? Thank God that sometimes he's not fair. And he's giving us room for grace and mercy, right? Thank God for that. I want to tell you this morning, God is so rich in mercy. When you look at rich in mercy in, in Greek, is actually Elias. And it's a present tense. It's a present tense, which means it's continual. God lives in a continual, ongoing state of mercy he's always rich in mercy so that means he was rich yesterday in mercy he's rich today in mercy and he's rich tomorrow in mercy it's an ongoing state and man that's amazing now you might be thinking to yourself well uh, when you think about it in old testament god wasn't this wasn't god this angry god who was just angry at everything and then all of a sudden, the New Testament, he's become more gracious and more loving and mercy. What happened to God? Did God grow old and he's just because of his age, he's just become more passionate? Is that what happened? No. You see, I think the problem is a lot of us have a wrong impression of God. When we think about God, uh, God we, we actually think about God in, 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 from Genesis chapter 3. All the way to Revelation 20. What happened in Genesis 3? Adam and Eve sinned. Right? Adam and Eve sinned. But I want to tell you, it doesn't start there. The Bible actually starts in Genesis 1. When God created everything and everything was good. It was good. He said he was pleased when he created everything. And then he created Adam and Eve and he put them in the place. Said, man, just, you're allowed to do whatever you want to do. Just don't touch that one tree. What happened? What happened? <laughs> they touched that tree. <laughs> they ate of the apple, right? Now God said, if you do that, you will die. You will surely die. What happened? Did, 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 did they die? Did, did God strike from heaven and kill Adam and Eve? He didn't, right? So it wasn't a physical death, but they died a spiritual death. Just imagine, God created everything perfect uh, from Genesis chapter 1 to 3. Everything is perfect. He's walking in the garden with Adam and Eve. Just imagine God walking with Adam and Eve in the garden. Just imagine that. What a loving father. And then sin came. And in Genesis 3, we were told when God came again to the garden, all of a sudden, he found Adam and Eve hiding, afraid, afraid. That, that's when fear comes in. Sin brings fear. They were afraid. They covered themselves with the fig leaves. And, and, and God said, what have you done? And they start blaming one another. That's what we do, right? That's just in the human nature. We blame one another, right? And all of a sudden, God started telling them what the result would be of their disobedience. So I said, I'm sorry, ladies. As a result of disobedience, you have to go through pain giving birth. So there will be labor pain. Labor pain. 
Guys, man, you got to work hard. You're going to be sweating to make that money. It's going to be hard. But that's the result of disobedience. Right? They were naked and shamed. What did God do? This loving, merciful God, what did he do? He actually killed an animal, sacrificed an animal, and covered Adam and Eve with the skin of the animal. He didn't leave them in their shame. He actually did the first covering of sin. Wow. Just foreshadowing what Jesus would do for all of us. That's a loving father. He covered them with the skin for their shame. His mercies are new every morning. It's there from the beginning. And guess what? It doesn't end. You know, a lot of times when we think about God, we only think about Revelation 20. And it talks about the consequences of sin and hell and and all of that. But I want to tell you. The Bible doesn't finish at chapter 20. It actually finishes in chapter 21 and 22 when it actually talks about a new heaven, a new earth. God, Jesus will come back again. He will make all things new again. Wow. It starts with a good God and it ends with a good God. Because His mercies are new every morning. I want to ask you this morning, so what should our response be to such a merciful God? What should be our response to what He has done? I want to tell you, our response should be that we should live and give our, offer our lives as a living sacrifice. Offer our lives as a living sacrifice. He has always been good. He's always been good. Always been good. You know, when I think about the Old Testament, and I love the Bible because it's so raw, unedited. It, it just says it as it is. And sometimes when we look at the great um, characters in the Bible, great, um, you know, they, they, they sinned. They sinned. They fell short. And David fell quite a few times short of God's glory. He sinned a lot. And his actions, he could have had severe consequences on generations and generations. And on one of these occasions, in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 14, it says this. This is his response when he was actually felt into sin. He said this. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercies is great. Do not let me fall into human hands. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Isn't that so true? Isn't that so true? We always want justice, right? We want justice. We want justice to be done. Except when it comes to us. When we are wrong, we want everyone to be gracious and merciful, right? That's the human nature. And David is like, man... I'd rather fall into God's hand because His mercies are great. But please don't hand me back to these people. Because people are not merciful. People are not merciful. Guess what? There's nothing new under the sun. Even today. God may be merciful to us. We as Christians, man. We have received great mercy from God. But we don't want to serve others with the same mercy that we have received. A lot of times we want to be judgmental. You see, the body of Christ are often those who show the least amount of mercy. And it's sad. Let me show you how much mercy means actually to God. Okay? Let me show you. When God gave David instructions about building the holy temple, you know, when you read it in the Bible, the dwelling place, it talks about the entrance, it talks about the storeroom, it talks about the upper room, and then it goes quite a few chapters on dimensions and materials, the silver, bronze, gold, and a lot of us skip past all of that, right? <laughs> and then 
And then when he gets to the part, when he talks about right in the middle of the holy temple, what he wants in the middle is the place of atonement. God tells David, right in the middle, I want you to put the place of atonement. And at the middle of that, I want you to put the mercy seat. Come on, church. I want you to put the mercy seat. You see... Why would God want right in the middle the mercy seat? Because God was saying, in my house, I want you to always make room for mercy. In my house, I want you to always make room for mercy. Why? Because it's at the center of his house. It's at the center of God's heart. It's at the core of who God is. Because with the birth of every new day, His mercy is already there. Listen, church. James warns us about this. James tells us in James chapter 2 verse 13. He says this. Therefore, there will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. If you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. That's deep. That tells me I need to be merciful. If I'm not merciful, if I start judging others, God will use the same measure to judge me. Wow. So why is it that Christians that should be full of mercy are normally the ones without least amount of mercy? We're often most judgmental people on the earth. Father, I want to pray that you help us, Lord. Help us to be more merciful to others. Help us to show and and give the same mercy that we have received to others. Father, I pray this right now in Jesus' name. You know, when I think about it, maybe, maybe the biggest reason why so many people stay away from God is not because of who God is. Maybe it's because of how we represent God to others. Maybe because how we represent God to others. is narrow-minded, is judgmental Christians who push away people from God. You know, um, while I was in Mozambique, man, <laughs> I'm sitting with four, you know, there's four pastors, you know, we're just chatting about church, about ministry, and you hear some crazy stuff. <laughs> and um, anyway... I was, um, I was, um, we talked about this, um, I've seen the movie, haven't you seen Heavenly Man, the Heavenly Man, Brother Young John, uh, the Chinese missionary, Chinese man. Um, So we were talking about it and they said, oh, you know, and then I'm like, man, I've seen the movie, but I just haven't read the book. So I got the book and while I'm on the road, I'm just reading the book. And if you're familiar with the story, man, he gets persecuted severely in China. And he goes through a whole lot and eventually finds himself in Germany. And towards the end of the chapters in his book, this is what he said. If you want to put that up, Niku, or or Yasmin, Heavenly Man, he said this. In China, Christians are persecuted with beatings and imprisonment, right? In West... Christians are persecuted by the words of other Christians. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? That's how we get persecuted. By the words of other Christians. All you have to do is just go and type a a pastor's name on YouTube. I promise you will find loads of messages. Loads of stuff that um, pointing him to Antichrist. (laughs) Everyone is a false teacher. Everyone is a false teacher. Everyone is a a Satanist. How can that be? How can that be? How can that be? And then we got all these Christians who spend hours and hours and hours trying to put together all these little videos and taking messages out of context and trying to discredit someone's ministry 
Instead of actually finding their own time and working and, and, and preaching the gospel to a lost generation who needs God desperately. Come on, Christians. We need to love others with mercy. Stop judging others and start preaching the gospel. Whenever you want to you, you know, show God's love to others, don't discredit your brother or sister. Don't judge others. That's why James said, you know, if you judge others, he will be judging you. He will be judging you. Do you want God to judge you the way you judge others? No. Show mercy. God has shown you mercy in the same measure. Make room for mercy towards others. Get, receive, receive mercy and give mercy back. Come on, Christians. Come on. You know what? Our church, when, 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 God, when I ask God, what do you want us to do? What is our mission here? What, is, what do you want us to do? God said, I want you to build a place of refuge and restoration. A place of refuge and restoration. Guess what? In order to be able to have a place of refuge and restoration, there needs to be mercy at the center of it. Right? You can't have judgmental Christians where just chase everyone away. Right? And that's why we say, come as you are. Come as you are. Come with your doubts. You got doubts about God? That's fine. Just continue coming. You got doubts? Come. Are you afraid? Don't worry. Just keep coming. Are you insecure? Come. Come with your brokenness. Come with your sinfulness. Even if you're in sin, that's fine. Come. You're addicted? That's fine. Come. You're addicted to porn, uh, uh, drugs, alcohol? That's fine. Continue to come to church. We will not judge you, but we will point you to Jesus. We will point you to Jesus. And in God's timing, God will do to you what he did to me. He changed me because of his mercy and his grace. Not because people were judging me. I was already judged. I was already guilty. You think when someone is in, in addiction of drugs and alcohol is not feeling guilt? They are guilty. That's why they keep doing it. To numb the pain. And, and, and the, 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 you know, the, the, to numb it. To just numb the pain. To take them away from reality. You don't need to tell them that they are sinful people. They already know. What you need to do is point them to Jesus. Point them to who can bring them out of their misery. Oh man, yesterday we had a great time. We had the steps day of grace course. When you really realize what Christ has done for you. You get set free. You get set free. You get set free. You know what? I'm not here to judge you. I've received mercy. And I want to give the same mercy back. It doesn't mean we won't tell you the truth. We'll still tell you the truth. But we always point you to Jesus. I can't change you. Only God can. And that's why we keep pointing you to Jesus. Pointing to the cross of Calvary. Where all our sins were nailed at the cross. Come just as you are. If you can come up, please. Now, some of you this morning, some of you this morning, you just need to receive God's mercy. You need to receive God's mercy. I want to tell you this morning that God has given you His mercy. All you have to do is just receive it. Receive it. Accept it. And I promise you, you will be changed. You will be changed. You will become a new person. Now some of you, you have already received God's mercy. And now what you need to do is create room in your heart for more mercy to give out to others. The same mercy that you have received. See, there's a difference between justice there's a difference between grace 
there's a difference between mercy. Remember, justice is when you get what you deserve. And boy, and boy, we like people to get justice, isn't it? Except when, when it comes to us. When it comes to us, we want to receive grace and mercy. What is grace? Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. And nobody here deserves salvation. Nobody here deserves salvation. Nobody here can earn it. You can't earn your way into heaven. The only way you can earn it is when you accept Jesus Christ into your heart. You are saved by God's grace. What is mercy? Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. I wonder who, who's here this morning so thankful of God's mercy in their lives this morning. God's mercy in their life. Come on. Can we just all stand if you can? Maybe worship thing can come back up please. So how should our response be to a merciful God? How should our response be? How should we respond to a merciful Father? I want to tell you this morning. Our response should be we offer our bodies the holy sacrifice as a living sacrifice back to God. Living for Jesus and worshiping for Him. It's not through just songs. Yeah, we sing songs to Him. But we worship Him with the way we live our life. We worship Him by the way we live our life. Thank God for His mercy. Now some of you might say, well, I thank God for His mercy. I'm still going through pain, man. <laughs> My body's a wreck. I feel everything's falling apart. Man, I'm broke. Government keep increasing prices and things, things are just going... It's not the government, but yeah, things are just going... I'm still hurting. I want to remind you what Jeremiah said in Lamentation chapter 3. Verses 22 to 23. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. It's a continual thing. It's never ending. It's never ending. They were there in Genesis 1. And they were right at the end of Revelation. And then in verse 23. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. Whatever you need this morning, I want you to close your eyes this morning. Whatever it is that you need this morning, I want you to know that He is here in this room. He's there with arms wide open. And He just wants you to Offer yourself as a living sacrifice to Him. And as you do that, God will make a new thing in your life. His mercies are fresh every day. I want to tell you this morning, every morning you wake up, and as long as you have the, the breath of life in you, remember this, God's mercies are new every morning. They were there yesterday, they were there today, and they will be there tomorrow. Whatever you need. His grace starts anew today. He is full of love. He's full of compassion. He's an amazing God. Father, we just want to thank you. We honor you. We praise you for your goodness, Lord. You are so good. Sorry for sometimes having the wrong understanding of who you are. Father, I pray that you help us to always remember. That you were good from the very beginning in Genesis 1 when you created everything. And as a result of sin, 
our eyes have been blurred up and we don't see your goodness all the time so we do apologize lord but help us father to really have a clear understanding of your goodness every day father we thank you that your mercies are fresh every day help us lord to be grateful and thankful for your mercies every day lord at the same time sometimes we can be very judgmental towards others lord i want to pray that you help us to not judge our brothers and sisters but to love them to only speak good of them help us to uh, you know stop murmuring and, and, and gossiping and father help us to really put you at the center of everything we do father help us to show the same mercy that you showed us towards others in the same way lord we pray that you help us that we continue point people to you lord we want this house to be a house of refuge and restoration a church where people can come just as they are help us lord to be able to be expect accepting them into with open arms and help us lord to be able to point them to jesus and be patient for jesus to do his thing because he's doing it to us we want to do the same thing towards others lord help us father god in jesus mighty name amen and amen I, I want to tell you this morning being a christian isn't just about a prayer you know a lot of times we make a mistake with thinking, oh we just said the prayers the sinner's prayer and, and and that's it it's not about a prayer it's not about attending a membership class and tick boxing that you're now a member it's not that being a Christian is a life fully submitted to following Jesus. A life fully submitted to following Jesus. It's wholly devoted a life to Jesus. It's not a one-time prayer. It's a lifestyle. Christianity is a lifestyle. It's not a Sunday morning thing. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. How do we, and, and, and it is a commitment as well. And God wants to have this relationship with you. And you wonder, well, how can I have this relationship with God? You know what? First and foremost, we need to step away from all the wrongdoing. We step away from our sinfulness and we recognize who, what Jesus has done on that cross. Who he is, he's the son of God who paid the penalty of our sins. He died in our place. Just imagine, we deserve God's wrath. We deserve God's punishment. But he took that upon himself. He took that on a cross. And guess what? He died in our place, but that wasn't it. The good news is God rose him from the dead. We don't deserve salvation. We don't deserve salvation, but, but by God's grace, we don't pray, pay the penalty that we do deserve. And because of that, our only response can be giving our lives back to Him. Not just part of you, all of you, everything. A lot of times we say, Jesus is at the steering wheel. A lot of times that's a lie. We allow him to steer some of our lives, but most of it we just want to be in control. Don't be a part-time Christian. I want to encourage you this morning. When you do that, when you allow him to be fully in control of your life without you even noticing your life starts to change for the good the things that you're struggling with you all of a sudden realize that you actually are being changed without you even trying 
That's what happened to me. <laughs> it's when we really seriously understand that we are at end of the road and there's nothing else we can do and we need a savior when you get to that point when you say I need a savior that's when he comes and saves us so if that's you maybe maybe you committed your life in the past but things have taken you away from God's love I want to give you an opportunity this morning and if you never made that decision this morning I want to give you also an opportunity to do that right now we want to pray this prayer together but remember this is just the beginning of it it's about you saying this prayer and really meaning it and dedicating your life back to Him. So say this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I give you my life today. Jesus, forgive my sins. Please save me. Thank you for your justice on the cross. Thank you for the grace that you saved me. And thank you for your mercy that is new every morning. Because of who you are, because of what you have done, I give you my whole life, all of it, every bit of it. Jesus, you are my savior. You are first. I will follow you every day of my life. I want to thank you for my new life. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you all. We hope that you've been inspired and challenged by this message. For more information about Wizenshaw Community Church Manchester, please visit wizenshawcommunitychurch.org.